everyone, as we continue our look at Napoleon's campaign in Italy. And thank you so much to all of you who went over to the gaming channel and watched the first episode of my Napoleonic campaign in Italy playing as Napoleon. It's going to be quite the challenge, and I'm looking forward to continuing that series. So thanks for checking that out. If you haven't already, there are links in the description to my other channels, uh, including the gaming channel. Uh, I've also put the link to the original content for this part two. Uh, over at Epic History TV. I'm also going to be signing up as a patron of theirs today, and I encourage you to do that if you like what they do to encourage their work. I also have my own Patreon. You're going to be hearing more about that very soon. Um, I've actually brought someone on my team for the first time who's going to help manage Patreon and help us to make most effective use of that. More will be coming, uh, including more about how we can better manage um interaction between me and our patrons and, and please i see people comment every so often that hey he only cares about patrons that's not true at all i read every single comment on every single video and if you have recommendations and ideas and requests use the comment section of these videos i will see those and i keep a list of the recommendations that people uh, make for me about videos they'd like to see me take a look at you don't have to be a patron or a member to be able to do that so thank you in advance and uh, let's go ahead and dive into part two of napoleon in italy May 1796. The French Revolutionary Wars have entered their fifth year. And on what most consider to be a secondary front, there has been a stunning development. A 26-year-old general of the French Republic, Napoleon Bonaparte, has waged a lightning campaign across northern Italy, defeating the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia and driving the Austrians across Lombardy. Just look at the dates there. Look how quickly this is happening. And I don't know what the scale is for this. We might take a look at a map. Uh, but uh, starting at the 11th of April and, and up to the 9th of, or 10th of May, like a month, he has defeated one nation and he's put the pressure on the Austrians now in Lombardy. He's moving quick. This is almost like a kind of an early form of blitzkrieg, of lightning war, of quick movements before your enemy can figure out what you're doing and bring his superior forces to bear on you. 2,000 Austrian troops remain holed up in Milan's citadel, but they cannot prevent his triumphal entry into the city on the 15th of May. Now, the French general holds court at the Palazzo Serbelloni, issuing decrees on behalf of the Directory in Paris, while his troops enjoy several days' rest. Lombardy is to be reorganized as a French client state, known as the Lombardic Republic. So we talked about this yesterday a little bit, the fact that one of the reasons why France is able to exert its power so much at this time in history is because on their eastern border, you don't have a united Italy. You don't have a united Germany. You've got the Holy Roman Empire and all its client states that all have competing uh, religious values, cultures, um, aims of their own in terms of political and military aims. Uh, they're not the united Germany and Italy of the 20th century. Uh, so that allows for you to come in and maybe get some of those guys on your side, which Napoleon's going to do throughout his campaigns. Uh, but then those guys are going to flip to the other side as soon as the, the advantage appears to swing. Political and economic reforms sweep away the old Austrian state to the delight of Italian intellectuals in cities like Milan. But the French also demand 20 million francs to Gotta help pay for, pay for the war while their troops requisition vast quantities of food, horses, cattle, and boots. Remember, when this whole thing began, what Napoleon got? Uh, basically a destitute afterthought of an army that doesn't have shoes in many cases and doesn't have weapons. I just started uh, watching the 2002 miniseries on Napoleon, and uh, it's fantastic, by the way. Uh, but one of the scenes early on, and I don't know if this particular part is true or not, but it illustrates the situation Napoleon is facing. He comes to take command of the army of Italy, and his aide is telling him, well, we've got cavalry, but they don't have any horses because they had to eat their horses. Whether that happened or not, it illustrates the, the problems that he was facing with this army. So 
conquering this territory, getting that money that he can send back to the government and hopefully justify being resupplied, but also getting those supplies and weapons and ammunition. It's going to reinvigorate his forces and help them to further victories. Most inflammatory are their attacks on the property and dignity of the Catholic Church, which enrage Italian priests and peasants. And this is not a real big surprise because remember one of the things that happens as a result of the French Revolution uh, is the revolution is not just against the monarchy and nobility, it's also very much against the church. Uh, you end up seeing a cult of reason and a cult of the supreme being set up. Uh, there's a big backlash. I don't want to call it atheistic, but it's certainly anti-religion. And are a gift to anti-French propagandists. On the 23rd of May, as Napoleon's troops set off in pursuit of the Austrians, revolt breaks out in Pavia. The next day, there are riots in Milan. Gonna slow you down. Napoleon races back to the city, where order is soon restored. But on the road to Pavia, at Binasco, he encounters a thousand armed rebels. Colonel Land's grenadiers rout the peasants, killing a hundred and burning the village. So in this situation, when you are conquering enemy territory, you've got a couple ways you can deal with it. You can try to placate the civilians. You can try to win them to your side uh, by how you treat them, by how you choose to occupy. Or you can use fear and violence to do it. Unfortunately, the first option takes a lot longer and requires a different kind of set of standards for how you deal with things and when you're kind of fighting a lightning war where speed and surprise are your keys to victory you don't have time for that so you've got to use swift but brutal violence to put these things down I'm not justifying it i'm just trying to explain it a terrible example which will be effective napoleon writes pavia is retaken the next day with little opposition a score of ringleaders, including several priests, are shot. Hundreds of hostages are taken from prominent local families to ensure future cooperation. Yep. Napoleon resumes his advance east. His army now organized into four divisions. Kilmaine's advance guard, Augereau, Massena, and Serrurier. So this is exactly a picture of what Napoleon's going to do throughout his career, right? Right now it's divisions. Eventually it will be corps led by these marshals. And uh, it, it's about spreading out but staying connected at the same time. It requires good communication uh, because being spread out, and they did a video on this talking about his structure and how he did things and why it worked. Uh, it allows you, when you're, especially if you're foraging in enemy territory, uh, to be able to move quickly, but also to supply more effectively. It also allows you, if one makes contact, to bring the others to their aid quickly. It works. It works really well. And, and you're going to see echoes of this in future warfare. Uh, the American Civil War, which you hear me talk about constantly because it's what I know the best, uh, those generals go to West Point in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. And what are they trained on? Napoleonic tactics. And so then you see at places like Gettysburg, for example, where the Union Army had their seven corps spread out. Uh, General Lee has his three corps spread out, but then they can quickly kind of bring them back together. And Gettysburg becomes the point at which they all converge because it's where all the roads go. And it's how you bring your spread out Army Corps back together. General Berlioz's Austrian army holds the line of the Mincho River with Lake Garda on his right and the great fortress of Mantua on his left. This, together with the fortresses at Peschiera, Verona, and Lagnago, forms the famous quadrilateral, four bastions that cement Austria's grip on northern Italy. And, and this makes sense, right? You're anchored on your right by the lake. You're anchored on your left by a, a well-fortified city. You've got a river running down the middle, and you can control the choke points. But... If it were anybody else you were facing, you'd be okay, but it's Napoleon, and he's gonna outsmart you. 
But once more, Beaulieu can't get a read on Napoleon's movements. He scatters his troops, trying to defend four potential crossing points, and is further distracted by fake preparations to cross Lake Garda by boat. In fact, Napoleon has decided to cross the Mincho at Borghetto. And when Kilmaine's advance guard arrives, they find the bridge defended by a single battalion of infantry and handful of hussars. The Austrians are soon driven back, but a sudden counterattack nearly bags General Bonaparte himself. A possibly dramatized account has him hopping over fences with one boot on to evade the hussars. Could you imagine how differently the next 200 years of world history go if he's captured or even killed at this battle? The whole history, the whole trajectory of Europe and therefore the, the world is different. This lucky escape leads to the formation of an elite cavalry detachment to act as Napoleon's personal escort. They are named the Compagnie des Guides à Cheval. Their commander is a young cavalry captain named Jean-Baptiste Bessière. In time, this unit will become the famous Chasseur à Cheval of the Imperial Guard. Light cavalry. The Emperor's ever-present bodyguard on campaign. Taken by surprise by the crossing at Borghetto, Bolio begins a withdrawal to a new defensive line in the Adige Valley. However, at Mantua, he leaves behind a reinforced garrison, well supplied and ready to withstand a siege of at least two months. Napoleon cannot bypass Mantua, its garrison is too powerful. But the fortress city will be a tough nut to crack. Its old walls surrounded on three sides by a lake and on the other by malarial marshland. The most unhealthy place mm. in Italy, Napoleon tells the directory. I mean, I suppose in that case, then you could always hope that they get malaria or they get some outbreak of disease and you win that way, but not going to happen. Problem is his lack of heavy siege artillery. Most of these guns are in Milan, bombarding the Austrians, still... So, right here, you see an example of a mortar. Now, we think of mortars in terms of the 20th century version of mortars, which, by World War II, they're, you know, a lot of them were these smaller, kind of easily movable mortars that one guy can carry one part and one guy can carry the base plate, and you can put them to get down together quickly. There were heavier ones, too, but uh, World War I, they have trench mortars, which are a little more like this. But previous to that, sometimes they're big, and sometimes they're they're firing like 12, 14-inch uh, balls. And what those are meant for is that they're meant to fire at a high trajectory that can get up and over walls, and so they're very often used in sieges. A lot of times they're mounted on ships and fired from rivers or from oceans or on lakes uh, because the, the regular cannon, they're their trajectory is just too low and they would just hit the wall and you need to be able to lob shells up and over. Hold up in the citadel. More guns were supposed to arrive by sea, but have been intercepted by British warships, commanded by a certain Commodore Horatio Nelson. This honestly has been the downfall of so many great conquerors. In the end, you could make the argument that what really defeats Napoleon on the continent of Europe is the British Navy. It's the blockade by the British Navy that leads to his rash attack on the Russians because of a series of events. It, it, it is connected, though, to the British Navy. It's the British Navy that's going to allow uh, for them to be able to get troops and supplies rapidly to places like Spain, where Napoleon runs into trouble. It, in World War I, it's the British Navy that really brings Germany to its knees and forces them into an armistice. Since April, Napoleon has launched three successful offensives, marched more than 200 miles, and won 10 battles. 
But finally, outside the walls of Mantua, he is brought to a halt. And the demands on his limited force are growing. Mm. He must maintain the siege of Mantua, even though its guns outnumber his own and no direct assault can be made. And typically for a siege, you want a significant advantage in manpower, like three, four, five to one in manpower. They don't even have more guns than the defense does. Imagine what Napoleon could have done if he would have had the 150,000 troops in the real armies in the north. He must protect his lines of communication back to France and guard against further revolt in Lombardy. And he must be ready to face the Austrians, who are receiving reinforcements from Germany and will soon counterattack. Shouldn't be able to win. To add to his problems, the French Directory demands that he lead an expedition to central and southern Italy. He's to threaten military occupation unless these states cough up huge sums to help fund the French war effort. Now, this is where it can be a challenge to have civilian leadership over a military force. We have that in the United States. We have a president who is the commander in chief. We have a secretary of the army, a secretary of the Navy, things like that. Uh, and, and it's a good thing. And it provides for checks and balances on the military. But it can be a challenge, too. In the United States, during the American Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was very much a hands-on kind of micromanaging commander-in-chief. And at times that was necessary with guys like McClellan who just would not move his army. But it also became a problem, for example, at Fredericksburg when his meddling and his pushing, pushing, pushing forced Burnside into an ill-advised attack that should never have been made. So it goes both ways. The bottom line is that civilian leadership that are hundreds or even maybe sometimes thousands of miles away from the situation, they don't know the circumstances on the ground. They're looking at a map and they're telling you what to do without knowing the details. Now, in this case, it works out okay, but it doesn't always work out that way. Napoleon vehemently opposes the idea Marching troops the length of Italy in high summer, he warns, will end in sickness and death. Fortunately, strong words alone persuade <laughs> Naples to sign an armistice. And in the end, Napoleon doesn't even have to go as far as Rome. The French march through the Duchy of Modena, the Papal States, and the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, raising more than 40 million francs in tribute from states that are powerless to resist. Get that money. Napoleon dines in Florence with the Grand Duke before returning to Milan. There he is reunited with his wife, Josephine, who's arrived from Paris, discreetly accompanied by her new lover. It was well known she had a lot of lovers during this time, and I'm not trying to defend it or justify it. She's several years older than Napoleon. She's been married once before. She's got kids that are growing up. He's off on campaign. She's doing her thing. Napoleon does not linger in Milan. Its citadel has finally fallen, freeing up his siege guns. His troops have seized another 150 guns from the forts of central Italy. Napoleon can now make serious plans to take Mantua. And he has no time to lose. In the Tyrol, the reinforced Austrian army is beginning to stir. Under a new commander. Bolio is gone. Now, 72-year-old Field Marshal Count von Wurmser is in command. A courageous cavalryman, vigorous beyond his years, and determined to avenge Austrian defeats in Italy. But he's 72 years old, which means he's got 72 years of built up ideas on how this is all supposed to work. And he's never faced somebody like Napoleon before. That experience can be good, but sometimes it can also hurt you. The storm is beginning to gather. These quotes are great. I love them. 
Since crossing the Mincho, Napoleon has reorganised and redeployed his forces. General Massena's division is near Rivoli, watching the road to the Tyrol. Two of his brigades, under General Sare, are at Salo, watching the western side of Lake Garda. General Despinois's division is in support at Pesquiera. General Augereau's division is around Lenyago, watching the eastern approaches, while Kilmaine's cavalry mounts patrols. General Serrurier's division carries out the siege of Mantua itself. So, again, I mean, this all makes sense, right? You've got multiple areas to cover, but they're close enough to where you can rapidly, you can pull back if you need to, you can redeploy, you can reinforce, you can pull guys in, but you can keep an eye out for where he's going to go. And you've got to assume that the Austrians are going to have to come down on both sides of this lake too, which provides you with the perfect opportunity to try and isolate and destroy part of his army. But Napoleon's hopes for a rapid conclusion to the siege are in vain. The Austrian garrison conducts a skillful and active defence, raiding French entrenchments and seizing supplies. Murat, recently promoted to Brigadier General, plans to lead a group of men in Austrian uniform across the lake at night to take the guards by surprise. Gutsy. But the operation's abandoned when the water level suddenly drops. The French step up their bombardment of the city firing more than a thousand cannonballs and mortar shells in one six-hour period. Wow. Mantua is being battered to pieces, but its walls are not yet breached. Mm. Napoleon is out of time. Field Marshal Wurmser is finally marching to Mantua's aid. He has divided his army into four columns. Two central columns are advancing down the Adige Valley directly towards Mantua. Another column to the east is making a wide flanking march, while a fourth column, under General Kostanovich, advances down the western shore of Lake Garda, planning to seize Brescia and cut Napoleon's line of retreat. It's a smart plan, and he's got the numbers in every area here, but he's facing Napoleon. Massena comes under heavy attack and, severely outnumbered, abandons Rivoli and begins a fighting retreat. As soon as the news reaches Napoleon, he races to Castelnuovo, ordering Augereau, Despinois and Kilmaine to join him as fast as possible. But suddenly, it is Kostanovich's column that's emerging as the greatest threat. General Sae's troops at Salo are heavily outnumbered. They put up a stiff resistance, but are forced to withdraw. The next day, Austrian troops surprise the French at Brescia. They take the town, as well as an army hospital containing 2,000 French sick and wounded. Rough start for the French. Even Napoleon's wife, Josephine, en route to Brescia, is nearly captured in the chaos. Wurmser has wrong-footed Napoleon. Already outnumbered, he's lost 5,000 casualties. His left flank is in tatters, and there's a real possibility he may be encircled. It's the greatest crisis he has faced as an army commander. And everybody faces these crises, right? But some people, they melt under that pressure. Other people, sometimes it causes them to focus even more clearly. Ulysses S. Grant was known for this, that in times of great stress and crisis, it seemed like his focus got clearer. And I think Napoleon has that same thing. And will force him to make an agonizing decision. He understands the value of time. On the 31st of July, after two months of blood, sweat and sacrifice, General Serrurier is ordered to abandon the siege of Mantua. Mm. He is to send two of his brigades to reinforce Massena and Augereau, and withdraw with the rest of his troops to guard the army's line of retreat. 
179 guns, plus ammunition and supplies which cannot be moved, are to be buried or tipped into the marshes. That's not a decision a lot of commanders are going to be willing to make. A lot of them are going to fall into the sunk cost fallacy. It's that we've spent two months on this siege. We've had men die. We've got too much at stake here. We have to see this through to the end. Well, you can do that, but it may cost you the campaign. Uh, so Napoleon's willing to make the hard decisions, the unpopular decisions, the painful decisions that at the moment may really sting, but may buy you the time that you need to win. Napoleon needs every man he can get, because in the midst of the crisis, he has spotted an opportunity. Kostanovich's advance has caught him off guard, but Lake Garda separates him from the rest of the Austrian army. Napoleon will concentrate his forces against Kostanovich, beat him in battle, then pivot again to take on Wermser. The French divisions are soon on the move. Kostanovich's troops reach Lonato, but here they encounter Massena's vanguard. Anytime you hear that word vanguard, it just means the, the troops out front, the guys in, the, in the, the lead of the advance. Austrians come under heavy attack, and with French reinforcements arriving, they have to pull back. The next day, the French retake Brescia along with most of their supplies, sick and wounded. There you go, got it back. Then Napoleon catches a lucky break. Wermser has been on Massena's heels, harrying his rear guard as far as Peschiera. But now he receives reports there are French forces massing between him and Mantua. Mantua is his priority, so he swings south, away from Kostanovich, towards a city Napoleon has already abandoned. Bad intelligence. Now, whether this was intentional on Napoleon's part and he fed bad intelligence to Wormser's army or if Wormser just heard this on his own and got bad, bad information, uh, boy, just a day or two is all you need to turn the tide here. And him just moving a few miles in the wrong direction buys you that time. By the time Wormser realizes his error, it's too late. He has gifted Napoleon 24 crucial hours. That's all he needs. A blunder for which he will pay dearly. Ah, nothing is lost while courage remains. I love these quotes, love them. The 3rd of August sees confused fighting west of Lake Garda. One French brigade slips through the wooded ravines unnoticed, straight into Salo, causing havoc behind the Austrian lines. But the Austrians repel three attacks on Gavardo, and all seems to be going well, until their own advance meets Massena's division at Lonato. Massena's counterattack is led by the 32nd Demi Brigade which is becoming known as one of the Army of Italy's most feared units. Bayonets only, Napoleon calls out, and you, 32nd, maintain your glorious reputation. The lead Austrian brigade is routed. Colonel Junot, though wounded six times, accepts their commander's surrender. Kwasdanovich's force has been mauled. Fearing for the rest of his command, and with no word from Wurmser, he decides he must march back around Lake Garda to rejoin the army. And now you've bought time to turn your army and take on the other half of the Austrian army. Exactly what he wants. The same day, 15 miles to the south, General Augereau's division fights an aggressive rearguard action near Castiglione, keeping Wurmser at bay while Napoleon deals with Kostanovich. Augereau begins with a bold attack on General Lipte's vanguard, driving it back to high ground near Solferino. But here, Lipte receives steady reinforcements 
as the rest of the Austrian army begins to arrive. Augereau keeps up the pressure, preventing an Austrian advance. And though there's a late scare when enemy cavalry sweep around his left flank, they are unsupported and soon pull back. For Augereau and his men, it is a long day of heroic action against a superior force. Can I just say here how fantastic all of this artwork is about these events? The colors, the it's just magnificent. And it's such a shame that so many of these battle flags didn't survive the Napoleonic Wars, because they're beautiful too. One which Napoleon will never forget. Twelve years later, as emperor, he will make Augereau Duke of Castiglione, and always remind his critics he saved us that day. Nevertheless, by nightfall, Augereau's division is at breaking point. Our soldiers are exhausted from fatigue and hunger. If you don't send me reinforcements, I won't be able to hold out. Brutally honest, that's what you need from your Next commanders. Next morning, French troops renew the attack on Kostanovich and quickly discover he's beating a hasty retreat. A major disaster is narrowly avoided when three lost Austrian battalions stumble into Napoleon's headquarters at Lonato. They call on the general to surrender. Napoleon responds by loudly ordering his grenadiers and artillery into position then demands that the Austrians surrender to him. This or, is like one of those scenes from a movie where the person that you expect to surrender turns around and demands they surrender instead. Like the scene in The Alamo with Billy Bob Thornton playing uh, Davy Crockett where he tells Santa Ana and his army to surrender to him. But it works in this put case. To the sword. It's a bold bluff. Few of his troops are anywhere near. But the Austrians meekly lay down their arms. As Napoleon swings his army round to take on Wurmser, the Austrian must decide whether to stand his ground or fall back to a stronger line behind the Mincho River. You should fall back. He chooses but you won't. to stay put. By engaging Napoleon, he hopes to buy time for Kostanovich to regroup and resume his advance, and for Mantua to be resupplied. His reasoning is sound, but his intelligence is out of date. And he's underestimated the speed at which Napoleon's forces will move. Story of their lives. At dawn on the 5th of August, the Austrian army is four miles east of Castiglione, formed up in two lines, its northern flank anchored on the village of Solferino, its southern flank on a well-fortified redoubt at Monte Medolano. Solid. Napoleon faces him with Massena's division in the north, Augereau's division in the centre, and Kilmaine's cavalry in the south. He's also formed an elite unit of grenadiers and cavalry to be held back for the decisive moment. For the breakthrough. Napoleon doesn't seem to have much of an advantage. But he has 10,000 more troops converging rapidly on the battlefield. 5,000 under General Despinois, marching from Brescia. 5,000 more under General Fiorella, coming from the south. So many of these battles come down to those rushing in reinforcements that are coming from other places to turn the tide uh, and can make the difference. Look at Waterloo. Now, I say this all the time about Waterloo. Even if Napoleon had won Waterloo, he wasn't winning that campaign. He wasn't winning that war. There would have been another Waterloo and another Waterloo. He, he just did not have at that point what he needed to overcome the coalition against him. But he could have won the Battle of Waterloo, and he was probably going to win the Battle of Waterloo, except for the timely arrival of Prussians on the battlefield. Sometimes that's what you need, just in the nick of time. To buy time for these reinforcements to arrive, and to lure Wurmser out of position, 
Napoleon orders Massena and Augereau to attack. There is a short exchange of fire. Then the French begin a feigned retreat. The Austrians take the bait, some units advancing off the high ground, while Wurmser extends his right wing, looking to outflank Massena's division. How many times have we seen this? We just saw this repeatedly in the English Civil War. Units getting drawn off the line and that messing up the battle. It happened at Hastings. It's why William the Conqueror ends up winning because of such a thing. It happened to a degree at the Battle of Bosworth. Uh, we see the Americans do that at the Battle of Calpins during the Revolutionary War. Around 9 a.m., the sound of gunfire from the south alerts both sides to Fiorella's arrival behind the Austrian left flank. Napoleon immediately orders Augereau and Massena to attack again, in earnest. Despinois's troops arrive to join the assault. But Napoleon has sprung his trap too early. Mm. Wurmser is not yet fully committed and reacts swiftly. He organizes a new line to fend off Fiorella. Wurms is a solid general. He's not making any major mistakes here, right? He's made some mistakes with intelligence and things like that, but he's making mostly the right choices on the battlefield. And had he been facing anybody else, maybe it's a different outcome, but nobody's really faced a guy like Napoleon. Hurriedly recalls his right wing. But he cannot save the redoubt at Monte Medolano. Napoleon's aide-de-camp, Major Marmont, leads forward a battery to blast the position. Hmm. And they don't have that many guns, remember? Napoleon had, what, 19 guns? So he's got to use them sparingly, and but effectively, on different places. And this really has shades of Little Round Top at Gettysburg, right? The big fortified hill on the left side where you've put your artillery and your men. You've got to hold it all costs or the whole line collapses if you lose that left flank. His guns open a devastating cannonade, clearing the way for an attack. Around 10 a.m., the reserve grenadiers charge forward with bayonets fixed, sweeping the Austrians off the hill. Meanwhile, to the north, the 4th and 5th Demi Brigades surge onto the Solferino Heights and seize the redoubt before Pozza Catana. Your two anchors, your two high strong points collapse, your line collapses. Carried forward by their momentum, they storm the Solferino Tower and village beyond, the shaken enemy falling back in disarray. The Austrians are hard pressed along the line, and now French cavalry and Fiorella's troops threaten to cut off their retreat. While Napoleon is active, energized, urging troops forward, Wurmser seems to go into shock. A French émigré serving with him recalled, he watched without seeing anything, saying anything, hearing anything. This brave old man, his head covered with white hair, did not think anymore. This is an important aspect of Napoleon's leadership that you don't hear as much about. It's all talk about tactics and strategy, but you read the accounts of people who were there, who served under him, who served with him, even some of his enemies. Uh, there was a magnetism, there was a charisma about Napoleon, about his leadership style. Yes, victories on the battlefield will win you the love of your men, and they will follow you. But it was more than that. It, there was something about the man that drew people to him, to, that people wanted to fight for him and to win for him. Finally, Wurmser orders a general retreat back across the Mincho River, covered by their cavalry and some late Austrian reinforcements. The French pursuit quickly peters out. After a week of forced marches in stifling heat, with little to eat or drink, Napoleon's men are close to collapse. 
but their general is content with what they have achieved. Jeez. And it's quite something to think about these casualty numbers, right? Because we're talking like the French lose a thousand men. The previous battle, they lost like 500 men. It's so tiny compared to what we're going to see later in some of these big battles like Leipzig, right? We're going to see in tens of thousands of casualties on each side with these massive 100, 200,000 man armies. Wurmser's army finds temporary refuge behind the Mincho River. But Napoleon immediately resumes the attack. Massena is sent north to relieve the French garrison at Peschiera and threaten Wurmser's line of retreat. The Austrian general has had enough. Mm. After ensuring the garrison of Mantua is fully resupplied and reinforced, he begins his withdrawal to the Tyrol to regroup and rethink. The French nip at his heels all the way. Napoleon has just endured his toughest challenge yet as an army commander. And though initially wrong-footed by his adversary, he's displayed brilliant flexibility and his usual energy to weather the crisis and then triumph. But Mantua remains the key to Italy. And while it stands unconquered, the Austrians will do everything in their power to save it. Wurmser will be back. And when he returns, he'll find himself on a collision course with Napoleon, as he launches his own attack on Austria itself. Mm. All right, until the next part, that was good stuff. If you want to see the rest, uh, the next couple of episodes, go check them out now over on Epic History TV. And we'll be back tomorrow with part three of our commentary. Thanks for watching.